exactly how this began, how this occurs, how this is implemented, how this is implicated, how this is practiced. Yes, it is very hard on the mind. This is very hard to wrap your mind around. Um, it, it, it just is. We, we human, human beings, humanity, we don't have these types of thought. These, these thoughts and, and creating and maintaining human beings as numerical values and co consumer go uh, consumptive goods, um, the commercial unit, uh, uses, usufruct, uh, all of these various titles. This is a psychopathic mindset. And, of course, it's going to be hard for you to conceptualize because we don't think like they do. Now, the downfall of the psychopath is written about in Revelation. That is the book that applies to the law merchant, the psychopath. The thing, dragon, demon, devil, Satan. Satan means your adversary to turn against another, which when you look at the etymology on a, a turn means to turn, to be the adversary, to be Satan, you realize that it's not as big as you think, and you take a step back and you can see the bigger picture. What is the bottom line? Well, the bottom line, of course, is in corporate psychology and the concept of human capital. What is human capital? Out of the government accountability office they define human capital as people that's it that's it bottom line um, and I will read from um, oh boy let me get the title uh, from the United States General Accounting Office Office of the Comptroller General Human Capital a self-assessment checklist for agency leaders. Well, who are the agency leaders? Administrators. And so you will find you have administrators in the Department of Health and Human Services. You have administrators in the Office of Population Affairs, which is the same entity. Just has a different mask on or clothes on, if you will. And, and that's the metaphor of within Revelation that maintains that, you know, at the end, everybody's naked again. And it goes all the way back to the inception. You know, you, you the, the tree of knowledge, the snake, it finds you in the garden and it offers you all sorts of shiny things. And if you grab it, you grab it. And those concepts are owned by that snake. Those concepts are of that snake in the garden. And so once you buy them, you partake of the tree of knowledge, they own you because you're purchasing their things. Now, in this article, uh, I will start to read. What is human capital? Simply stated, human capital means people. There are, however, two key principles that are central to the human capital idea. First, people are assets whose value can be enhanced through investment. For all of you out there that's had an attorney come in with interest, that's an investment. They have interest. As with any investment, the goal is to maximize value while managing risk. As the value of people increases, so does the performance capacity of the organization, and therefore its value to clients and other stakeholders. I know everybody who listens to this program has learned hopefully that the human being up until now being held in holding corporations was actually the stock option the thing backing these stocks you see the stock market which is the farm you never see the stock option that's you the reason you're an option is that you have free will you can either accept this and patronize this thing or you don't that's the risk Um, as the value of people increases, so does the performance capacity of the organization and therefore its value to clients and other stakeholders. 
Second, an organization's human capital policies must be aligned to support the organization's, quote, shared vision. That is the mission, vision for the future, core values, goals, and objectives, and strategies by which the organization has defined its direction and its expectation for itself and its people. Policy. That's corporate policy. So here you have policy, and you need to go look and see who directs policy. Okay, we talk about administration, we talk about corporate council, we talk about all of these things. Well, in a, in a marquee, or in a house, which is what a marquee is, is the House of Representatives, or the show itself, the carnival, in the marquee, the directives are maintained on a billboard. Well, that billing board is called the Board of Governors. And that billing board, for example, with the scribes, is the Broadcasting Board of Governors. You can find that at bbg.gov. Those are the scribes. That is the thing that's promoting this agenda. That is the thing that's directing this agenda. Now, who are the directors? Well, you go back to the 1947 National Security Act, and you find that that established the National Security Council. Under that National Security Council, you see the development and establishment of the Central Intelligence Agency. Well, that agency is actually the production company for the whole thing. Okay, so you have various directives maintaining policy through the administration and directives of, of course, Congress. These are congressional actions. And then you have the show or the presentation that's put on through the production company of the Central Intelligence Agency. If you would like to read about that or, or even listen, I have it up on my YouTube. I read uh, book four uh, of the Church Committee reports regarding supplementary detailed staff reports on foreign military intelligence. And in that, it maintains, you know, what the game is. And it maintains what the CIA's action is, how they produce these intelligence productions, and it gives examples of these intelligence productions, such as Korea, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, etc., etc. And they maintain these productions to pit you against each other, to polarize you against each other, so that you think that you are not the same as somebody else. So, whereby you are allowing polarization, secularism. So everybody's taking up all these names and titles and calling themselves different things and concepts and situations and, and everything else, which allows us to be separate so that we can be preyed on. That's the absolute rule when a predator is hunting something. It wants to get it to the edge of the herd. And so to do that, it's got to separate it somehow. And, and within human society, uh, we are separated in the mind. And that goes all the way back to the separation of the spiritual and the temporal. All of these things are written, and um, that's what Jesus was maintaining. He said, you know, you know all these things. It's all there. It's all written. You just have to put it together, and you have to work it out to where you can cure this. And that is what we did. Years and years ago, uh, we began looking at the biblical texts and the metaphors that they've been presenting to us. And in the game of chess, of course, that is... The, the game book, the rule book, just like there is with any other game, there is a book. And the Old Testament, of course, is the manifest. It's the rules of their game, how they perpetrate the game against us, how to create in us those thoughts that separate us, how to get us off of each other and off of ourselves, which is the main aspect you see in Exodus. Exodus actually means outside of God. Now, what would be the reason to be outside of God? Well, if you do not know the self and you do not know your walk, you do not know who you are, you're able to patronize another and call another your father. And that um, is relative to the Lord God. Now, what did Jesus say about that? First Corinthians 6, he says that we can only fornicate by giving our body over to the Lord God. Well, how do you do that? Well, within corporate psychology and accepting these concepts and titles, 
you're giving it your body. You are allowing it by contract to take you and move you about the chessboard. That was the saddest thing for all of us during this time of torture um, under and domestic terrorism Im Im implicated by the United States Incorporated against us as we were facilitating these orders and as we were taking them on was the aspect of Eve. Eve is always around and Eve can be in the form of a male or female, it doesn't matter. It depends on how quickly they are um, consuming these concepts. And when mom ran off and went to the other father in the action of uh, warfare, of course, she was inundated with advertisements and, and everything else and they had diagnosed her with cancer and and immediately started chemotherapy because, you know, otherwise we would have talked her out of it. Of course, the snake in the garden, he has to move really quickly in order to make people sick. In order to cash in on your estate, your body, to use it in all manner of ways. And, of course, at the end, uh, we saw how much they had to expand in order to keep her in that position. Wherein they were surrounding her with three and four doctors and priests and all of these agents surrounding her and, and providing her all of those advertisements and beautiful things and facilitating this psychological warfare upon her as well as the chemical and biological warfare upon her body whilst doing so. Now we are not the only example, we are the common occurrence um, this happens every day when you go to the doctor because you you are feeling disease. There's no such thing as disease. You are feeling disease, and when you feel that, if you go off to the other father, it allows you to become sicker. And uh, we watch this play out again uh, with Bo's mom, and and it was. Absolutely horrifying, of course, being attacked in all manner of ways, constant, without rest or ability to uh, breathe, basically, because in order to remove the firstborn son, which is Bo, and his ability to come up against him, they've got to constantly pound and pound and pound and pound with an action of fourth generation warfare. And, um, it is so heart-wrenching to have watched this and to have seen you know, them take mom and do what they've done. However, it allowed us to evidence genocide against the human race. And throughout this case, ongoing, uh, this evidence was put on record. This evidence was given to the House of Lords. This evidence was given to the State Department. And on October 7th, John Kerry got his. The CIA got theirs. The um, House of Representatives and the Senate and the Defendant's Council got all of these things and they agreed with us. They did not argue. And based on the statutory provisions, they had 21 days to do so. They did not do so. So on the 28th, we put in the final order. And of course, the last parties were served yesterday as Bo's mom was being murdered. And all of this is evidenced on the record and start to finish the evidence was yes indeed they were facilitating genocide against the human populace now the most profound aspect of that of course is the psychopath is not human it is a different race it is an inferior race to the human race as it doesn't have the frontal lobe. It is not evolved. 
whereby in the action of genocide they are perpetrating their crimes against another another race which allows the um, process against them now to occur and in this they have entered themselves into the court of exchequer the cargo hold of the ship um, again in uh, May we entered into the agreed entry with uh, Northern Holdings and the holding corporations themselves to hold that other product in the cargo hold in the holding corporation uh, July came the evidence that yes indeed they are bankrupt and depraved and they were declared dead according to the Cesar K. Act. In all of these things now that is what allows them to be held accountable for the onslaught against humanity in the action of constant warfare biological warfare psychological warfare chemical warfare against mankind this will no longer be tolerated and it has been laying down um, the United States in REM which means against a thing cannot be a thing at all incorporated libertas at liberty has won the United States incorporated is no longer within honors and that's the requirement of the ability of being granted liberty liberty is a franchise only granted within honors now this is all written this is in the um, Boris and Chase's charter all the way back um, it's still in play um, we left a lot of their treaties and their trade agreements in play because now that the other product is in the chute the dead thing it has to pay them back we're not going to allow them to just go away quietly um, and in this we followed the rules that are written for us and according to God's word that maintains they will be held accountable ten times ten when we came up with the numerical values of the dead thing the use of natural person otherwise known as the psychopath we found that the reason that that is ten times ten is that there are way less of them than there are human human beings and so they have to work harder their, their bodies are going to be used in various ways times ten and so when we laid down this last order we left it up to their imagination on how they want to use that fiction um, so you're gonna see some pretty strange things coming through the mainstream media as we have been I mean it's like crazy out there uh, but this is the reason you're seeing those things is that they do have to um, you know uh, come up with new and better ways of of allowing that product to produce because w with the human being they had limitations of course um, but now they don't because the psychopath is always a fiction including its own sentience it is not a sentient being it relies on a body politic to survive and so um, the part of the order of course was that yes we also agree now that the psychopath is in the shoot uh, we're all for abortion so if one psychopath kills another it is to be considered abortion only because the psychopath is not a sentient being it it, it relies on a host for its survival um, so we did leave that definition and that attorney um, word play in there um, allowing for these things to occur because I could care less I this is um, probably the Bo's mom was for me personally the um, let me see 37 uh, about the the um, 41st time that I've watched uh, the psychopaths torture a human being to death in variance on the use of metasoma veta and um, uh, it, it isn't going to happen anymore.
it is not going to happen anymore. It will not happen anymore. And um, the use of psychology against the human being is no longer lawful or legal in any way. Uh, and that was also in the order. Um, there is going to be the aspect of closing down the Hitler youth camps, otherwise known as educational facilities, and that's slowly happening at this time. However, uh, upon this last order, it's to happen more immediately. Um, they lost their funding uh, back in March, of course, and since that time they have been um, appealing for uh, private donations to keep their public services in line and, and running and at this time it is to be ceased immediately um, and, we're, and we're watching this you know uh, UNESCO yesterday um, cut the United States Incorporated out of their program because the United States Incorporated could not pay their dues um, and, and the reason for that is that they were embezzling from the House of Lords from the Treasury by appro appropriations maintained by diagnosing all of you human beings, all of us human beings, and using the ICD-10 codes by which to do so and to generate revenue into attorney pockets while they destroy the human body day after day, moment by moment. Uh, that is not going to be tolerated either. Um, a lot of this, uh, again, it's it's hard to wrap their mind around uh, these things. Um, so I'm going to start out with reading about the origins of industrial and organizational psychology so that everybody can be aware of how you got there. Industrial and organizational psychology is a relatively new idea. In fact, the notion that the principles of science would be applied to work settings has been around for less than 100 years. Contemporary industrial and organizational psychology has its roots in the history of industry as well as the two world wars during which eras psychologists were called upon to help address the crucial military concerns of recruitment, selection, and morale. Here we review three important influences on the development of industrial and organizational psychology. Scientific management, ergonomics, and the human relations approach to management. The advent of scientific management. The pioneers in applying scientific methods to the workplace were not psychologists, but engineers. They focused on scientific management the managerial philosophy that emphasizes a worker as, as a well-oiled machine, and the term, determination of the most efficient methods for performing any work-related task. Yet these engineers sounded like psych psychologists at times. Among them was Frederick Winslow Taylor, the mastermind of the idea of scientific management. Taylor, from 1911, suggested the following guidelines. And if you go back to Wilson's speeches, you'll find uh, he was uh, speaking Wilson's, or speaking Taylor's um, suggestions. Taylor in 1911 suggested the following guidelines, which have continued continuing influence today. Jobs should be carefully analyzed to identify the optimal way to perform them, which you'll find in the Human Factors and Ergonomic Society. Employees should be hired according to the characteristics associated with success at, at a task. Now, remember that word because you are not a character, you're a being. And so once you take up that title, you have a new character and you're an actor in this play. These characteristics should be identified by examining people who are already successful at a job. Employees should be trained at the job they will perform. Employees should be rewarded for productivity to encourage high levels of performance. Now, uh, that is Pavlov's dog, of course. You all know about sticks and carrots. You know, if you all have children, most of you, uh, the majority anyway. And, um, you know, this is practiced day after day. You want a piece of candy, and, and you have this... Uh, 
Chester the molester always sticking his hand out the car window offering you candy if you'll do a better and better job. But it's so hidden and called government or called organization or called management or federal emergency management or any number of things, um, you know, other than what it is, which is basically human trafficking, moving you outside of your being, uh, using different methodologies and methods and um, sticks and carrots, they call it sticks and carrots and procurement, and you can find that on online anywhere. Um, it's a vastly shared concept of by which to procure human beings in, in the garden. I mean, that's what it is, bottom line. Taylor's approach was influential in American business, including clothing and furniture manufacturing, and most particularly the automobile industry, where it dramatically boosted productivity and profits, especially in the years before World War I. Now, anybody who, you know, studies like we do and everything, you can go back to Ford. And these were the directors at that time. The Ford Corporation, um, throughout time, you've got ATT, you've got all sorts of them. Um, the other day I was reading from the Broadcasting Board of Governors, and you have Qualcomm Communications, and, and all of these um corporate council members that are sitting there directing policy based on the most efficient means of moving the human being and, and making it the most efficient product or human capital that they could come up with. And all of these things, of course, are just a show. It's just an act. And man itself is a legal creation. Well, man itself is a legal creation. You are a being, before you're given a name, you don't need to be identified or described in some way. That's not the book of life. That's the book of dead the moment you're written down on something else. And in the action of altering your heading, alteration of heading, according to 46 U.S.C. chapter 311 and 313, um, to do so uses the psychological mechanisms over and over and over again. It's got to tell you and describe you as something, and then it's got to teach you to go ahead and, and seek that definition or seek that description of writing about yourself. And so if they tell you you're a good boy or a bad boy, what are you going to do? The, your first uh, reaction to being told that you're a bad boy or a bad girl is to seek to be good or better. So we, you go out and you get this education, which is the indoctrination program itself. Education, the, the word education stems from pedagogy. Pedagogy meaning, and its absolute definition, is attendance on boys. That's removal of you, the firstborn son. So you can't stand up. It's teaching you that you're something else. And it has to teach you that you're something else. Otherwise, it cannot own you. There's no way that it can own you. And um, here we are. Now, once you can no longer be owned, and you're no longer on the chessboard, you're no longer part of the show or an actor in the show, what happens? Well, it ends, doesn't it? And then we find ourselves, you know, um, in Revelation itself and walking through Revelation. Well, what's happening now? Well, they're in failure. The dragon had delegated its authority to compartmentalized minions and useful idiots. And it started devouring its own tail. It's in failure. It, it's just done. And as you read through, well, what, what else does it say? Well, it says when Babel falls, which is language, psychology, culture, religious indoctrination, when that falls and you're no longer indoctrinated, you're no longer subscribing to this thing and you're no longer walking along and it's a fiction buying these concepts, the law merchant wails. It cries. Well, why does it do that? It requires you to buy. It requires you in the garden to go to it. It requires you to patronize it in that garden, to give up your garden, because it's no longer theirs or yours once you subscribe to this policy. Now, I know this is overwhelming. I, When I first started years and years ago, 
You know, I, I just assumed that I'd be teaching until I died, and then possibly, you know, our children would take up from there. And, and one day it would be over. It's over. And, um, you know, the most profound for me was that for years, you know, I've, I've looked at the Atlantic Charter, and I've looked at the Atlantic Charter, and I wanted to get rid of that thing. You know, it was, like, so horrifying to me to see that, based on the actions of Congress, somebody or some entity was choosing its own form of governance through congressional action, through the majority of Congress, you know, meaning uh, if there was a majority of Democrats in the House uh, and Senate, that it would be a Democratic governing force if the, and if there was a majority of republicans in the house and senate then we'd have a republican government and that was the most beautiful for me is to see that 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 word the word government is actually the action the action of governing and what the psychopath had chosen to implicate against humanity was actually the Korean model. And that's their chosen form of governance, not mine and not yours. It's not the chosen form of governance for humanity. The psychopath is the one that's acting as a fiction. The psychopath is the one that's in the holding corporation and the cargo hold of the ship whereby they are on the chessboard and I watching mom pass and watching her be tortured and being subjected to all of these agents around us the last few months the threats against my daughter and all of these pressures I am, uh, I found out that I'm quite vengeful, and uh, I never, ever, ever imagined that I would write and help write what was written to put them in the places that they're going into. I never once imagined that it would I would get to that point where there was so much pressure upon me that instead of lying down again and being beaten down, that I would ever be able to rise out of that. And without Bo around me, I don't think that I would have been able to, and vice versa. And it's been a very... Um, you know, profound uh, walk and journey because ultimately, in the end, um, I am absolutely vengeful and I have no sympathy for the psychopath. I have no empathy, I have no compassion. And witnessing what, what we've witnessed over the years and, and what's happened upon humanity since the 1100s has been, you know, not only awe-striking and horrifying and, you know, I don't, I don't think there's even a description, um, but now it's over, and you'll be feeling this soon, um, you'll be seeing it in the mainstream, um, of course, you'll be hearing it here, uh, Revolution Radio, These Changing Times, No Borders, uh, all of us, it's, it's not, uh, we're no longer silent and we're no longer oppressed. That was, that was something that, you know, it, it, it was separated, you know, going through it again this time and watching how they bring the hammer down. They can only do that if we're consenting, if we buy into it. And that's what it says. Um, I, you know, I want to read 
from Revelation 19 for everybody who is listening because bottom line it is what Jesus said absolutely as to you are known by your works in action the psychopath is known for what it is you are known for what you are and um, Revelation 19 11 and I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he doth judge war and make war his eyes were as flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And that's it. The Lord God is absolutely not God. The Lord God is, of course, the landlord. And again, Jesus speaks of that. You can only fornicate with the Lord God in 1 Corinthians 6. But the most amazing and awesome is your name. As you walk as to the word of God, there is no other name. You have no other name. And it's always been here, right at your fingertips. And Jesus said that in uh, Matthew 18. The Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. As he was speaking about the um, harm upon the children. He didn't say is coming or will be back. He said the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. And when you break down... The word resurrection, it means to stand again. It doesn't mean you're coming back from the dead, which would be reincarnate. It says you're already here, you just don't realize yourself. And that's, that's basically how Revelation opened up, opens up. It says when the Lamb is able to open a book, when you realize what's happening to you, that's when your wrath is made known and you stand up and you come against the Lord God. That's when you stand up on behalf of all mankind. It doesn't, you know, we don't, we don't have an option to save, you know, one sect or another sect or one group or another group or our own children, as they've learned. I mean, I was given that opportunity this year with the pressures put upon us by the CIA and FBI, you know, when they took Mikhail last year and everything else. But bottom line, I'm not in this for me. I'm in this for everybody else. And that's what the Sesar Kevai Act actually was. To say, Tui Kevai means with what cause do you live? And it's repeated in Matthew 10. Uh, Jesus said, you know, don't worry about your mothers or your fathers or your sons or daughters. We need to worry about the whole here. That's what this is all about, is the absolute whole, which is the United States in REM at all libertas, otherwise known as I am. And that's globally the human being. We didn't order anything less. We didn't do anything less. We didn't take anything for ourselves or in groups or within a title we realized that we had to do this on behalf of all humanity to stop the genocide perpetrated upon humanity psychological warfare chemical warfare biological warfare you know years ago when when I started researching the concept of AIDS and HIV I was so appalled to find that it was created simply not only of the mind and buying concepts but the action of biological warfare upon us which is the um, trimethylsulfate it's a chemotherapeutic antibiotic so first you buy into that you're at disease or discomfort and you go to the doctor because you have a cold or whatever else and you get better for a little bit and then you get sicker later 
And so they give you another derivative of trimesulfate, which can be in the form of Bactrom, or um, it has many names uh, used for lung problems and urinary tract infections and everything else. And as you're on that medication for chronic long-term use, switched back and forth and given different doses, eventually the chemotherapeutic aspect of that medication breaks down your immunity, and they can diagnose you with HIV or AIDS. And for those that have lost family members to such a horrifying thing, they will be held accountable. They are held accountable at this time. And they will be held accountable for these things. No one can replace your lost loved ones, of course. But you can take solace in knowing that they were innocent when they bought into this. They were innocent children, as Jesus speaks of in Matthew 18. This onslaught has been perpetrated through the use of education and the media psychological warfare upon everybody and fourth generation warfare low intensity conflict so you don't see what's going on and all of these things will pass and as I said I we can't replace what was lost but they will be held accountable and this will not occur again the show it's been exposed they've been revealed for what they are that's the whole point of everything that we've done everything that I've ever done I just follow the rules set forth by Jesus and it says walk this way just do this and and he said you know all you have to do is suffer all things bear all things and let it happen don't offer them resistance don't offer resistance and that includes taking up a name which is the ohm that is absolute resistance or a resistor and again you can see this in Revelation in order to reveal what they're doing all we had to do was suffer what they were doing and evidence their works and actions which is their mark of the beast and in doing so there is no due process and that's something very funny when it when I think about that um, there is humor in that because they've been indoctrinated with this thing called due process and they want their due process rights and everything else. There is no due process upon the evidence, which is why they implicated the attorney work product doctrine and such as sorry deceases back in 1938. You know, if they were allowing evidence on the court record, this would have never gotten to this place and time where all human beings can be used as corporate stock and product. And so we just took everything back to the origins. You know, the evidence is evidence. And due process is a concept that maintains that you can lie your way out of things or buy your way out of things. Well, in our orders, we maintain that you cannot buy judgment. You're not going to buy justice. You're not going to buy yourself out of this. We didn't allow for any weight of that. It doesn't matter if you're a billionaire or you're a millionaire or multi multi billionaire or multi millionaire. There's not enough money in the world for you to buy yourself out of this thing. Once you're marked, you're marked. That is your mark, and you're gonna wear it. And then you're gonna sleep in the same bed that you made. And I take great pleasure in not only speaking this, but watching this occur at this time. Um, having witnessed so many things upon mankind so many things that were implicated against humanity at your hand by your works in action and again these things are no longer tolerated in any way shape or form um let's see i had some articles that I had open and um, here they are okay uh, hmm. okay so apparently uh, those are lost I wanted to touch on these um, the Obama, Obama administration um, 
implicating its uh, Obamacare. And on Friday, um, there was a report the Obama administration on Friday will complete a generation-long effort to require insurers to cover care for mental health and addiction, just like physical illnesses. Now, what that does is it creates in the mind that those things are just the same as just the same as physical illnesses or injury or whatever else. It's another concept and another way of deriving revenue off of the human being. Now, when they up the ante like that, of course, as I said, we beat them to the punchline. They, they lost their funding. They're not going to be able to do that. But everybody needs to start you know, really being aware of how many concepts are issued and offered every day on a day-to-day -day basis throughout the media um, uh, magazines especially magazines now uh, colorful things television programming radio broadcasting uh, books um, you know, all these concepts you know you have the uh, you know, C spot Ron books and you've got the implementation of describing to us what a uh, law enforcement officer was in our little books when we were little, you know, and these are all written by the Rand Corporation, of course, Rand McDally, uh, Rand McDally, um, implicating this, you know, basically a business structure and teaching the product or, or moving the product on where it wanted it to go and formulating this little product on, on what it should do and how it should act and what parts move what and what does what. And, um, for me, um, you know, you go back to the Leviathan, and this was written by Thomas Hobbes. Ooh, I think it was in 1651. If, yeah, 1651. And um, he wrote a book. It's called The Leviathan, or The Matter, Form, and Power of a Commonwealth, Ecclesiastical and Civil. And this is by, of course, Thomas, Ho Thomas Hobbes of Malmesbury, London. Uh, it was printed for Andrew Crook at the Green Dragon in St. Paul's Churchyard in 1651. And I'll start reading out of that before the break. Uh, I know we're coming up on the, the um, our break. Now, the contents and chapters, and anybody can find this. I think Google Books has it on Google, if you go to um, Google Books, um, the, um, the contents of the chapters, the first part of man is the introduction, of course, of sense, of imagination, of the consequence or train of imaginations, of speech, of reason and science, of the interior beginnings of voluntary motions commonly called the passions and the speeches by which they are expressed of the ends or resolutions of discourse of the virtues commonly called the intellectual and their contrary defects of the several subjects of knowledge of power worth dignity honor and worthiness of the difference of manners of religion, of the natural condition of mankind as concerning their felicity and misery, of the first and second natural laws and of contracts, of other laws of nature, of persons, authors, and things personated, of the causes, generation, and definition of a commonwealth, of the rights and sovereigns by institution, of several kinds of commonwealth by institution and of succession to the sovereign power. And we'll be back. Stick around, folks. Welcome to Scottish Sovereigns on the Land and the home of No Borders Radio. And let them know what they are facing as well, because the court, apparently their handlers are not going to do such things. Now, before the break, we were discussing um, 
the Leviathan. Um, the 20th part, of course, is the of dominion, paternal and despotical, of the liberty of subjects, of system subjects, political and private, of the public ministers of sovereign power, remember power can only be vested, of the nutrition and procreation of the commonwealth, which of course we delve into as the Codex Elementarius means big book, of counsel, of civil laws, of crimes, excuses, and extenuations, of punishments and rewards, of those things that weaken or tend to the disillusion of the commonwealth, of the office of the sovereign representative, of the kingdom of God by nature, of the principles of Christian politics, of the number, antiquity, scope, authority, and interpreters of the books of Holy Scripture, of the significance of spirit, angel, and inspiration in the books of Holy Scripture, of the significance in Scripture of kingdom of God, of holy, sacred, and sacrament, of the word of God and the prophets, of miracles, and their use of the significance in Scripture of eternal life, hell, salvation, the world to come, and redemption. Redemption, of course, being a banking term. Of the significance signification in scripture of the word church meaning a group of people not really one that's following God or anything just a group of people of the rights of the kingdom of God in Abraham Moses the high priests which of course magistrates e force they've been called back in Sparta and the king of Judah kings of Ju Judah of the offices of our blessed Savior power ecclesiastical of what is necessary for a man's reception into the kingdom of heaven, of spiritual darkness from misinterpretation of scripture, of monology and other relics, relics of the religion of the Gentiles, of the darkness from vain philosophy and fabulous traditions, of the benefit that proceedeth from the darkness and to whom it accrueth, which is happening now, and, of course, the review and conclusion. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, of course, um, but I would like to delve into the introduction. Uh, and, of course, this is the Leviathan, or the, ma the um, matter, form, and power of the Commonwealth by Thomas Hobbes. The introduction, and I'll start, quote, Nature, the art whereby Goth, God hath made and governs the world is by the art of man as in many other things so in this also imitated that it can make an artificial animal for seeing life is but a motion of limbs the beginning whereof is in some principal part within why may we not say that all automata or engines that move themselves by springs and wheels at the watch have an artificial life for what is the heart but a spring and the nerves but so many strings and the joints but so many wheels giving motion to the whole body such as intended by the artificer art goes yet further imitating that rationale and most excellent work of nature man for by art is created that great leviathan called a commonwealth or state in Latin, this is called civitas, which is but an artificial man, though of greater nature and strength than the natural, for whose protection and defense it was intended, and in which the sovereignty is an artificial soul, as giving life and motion to the whole body. The magistrates and other officers of judicature and execution, artificial joints, reward and punishment by which fastened to the seat of the sovereignty every joint and member is moved to perform his duty, are the nerves that do the same in the body natural. The wealth and riches of all particular members are the strength, salus populi, or the people's safety. It's business. Counselors by whom all things needful for it to know are suggested unto it are the memory, equity and laws, and artificial reason and will. Concord health, sedition, sickness, and civil war death. Lastly, the pacts and covenants by which the parts of this body politic 
were at first made, set together, and united, resemble that fiat, or the let us make man, pronounced by the Lord God in the creation. To describe the natural of this artificial man, I will consider first the matter thereof, and the artificer, both which is man. Secondly, how and by what covenants it is made, what are the rights and just power or authority of a sovereign? And what is it that preserveth it and dissolve it? Thirdly, what is a Christian commonwealth? Lastly, what is the kingdom of darkness? Concerning the first, there is a saying much usurped of late, that wisdom is acquired not by reading of books, but of men. Consequently, whereunto these persons that for the most part can give no other proof of being wise, take great delight to show what they think they have read in men by uncharitable censors of one another behind their backs. But there is another saying, not of late understood, by which they might learn truly to read one another, if they would take the pains, and that is, Nasi Tapesum, read thyself which was not meant, as it is used now, to countenance either the barbarous state of men in power towards their inferiors, or to encourage men of low degree to a saucy behavior towards their betters, but to teach us that for the similitude of th thoughts and passions of one man to the thoughts and passions of another, whosoever looketh into himself and considereth what he doth, when he does think, opine, reason, hope, fear, etc., and upon what grounds. He shall thereby read and know what are the thoughts and passions of all other men upon the like occasions. I say the similitude of passions with her, which are the same in all men, desire, fear, hope, etc., not the similitude of the objects of passions, which are the things desired, feared, hoped, etc. For these the constitution individual and particular education do so vary, and they are so easy to be kept from our knowledge, that the characters of man's heart, blotted and confounded as they are with dissembling, lying, counterfeiting, feeding, and erroneous doctrines, are legibly only to him that set, searches heart. And though by men's actions we do discover their design sometimes yet to do it without comparing them with our own, and distinguishing all circumstances by which the case may come to be altered, is to decipher without a key, and be for the most part deceived by too much trust or by too much diffidence, as he that reads is himself a good or evil man. But let one man read another by his actions, never so perfectly it serves him onely with his acquaintance, which are but few. He that is to govern a whole nation must read it in himself, not this or that particular man, but mankind, which though it be hard to do, harder than to learn any language or science yet, when I shall have set down my own reading orderly and pers perspicuously the pains left another will be only to consider, if he also find not the same in himself. For this kind of doctrine admitteth no other demonstration. And we'll begin of man. Oop. Chapter 1 of Sense Concerning the thoughts of man, I will consider them firstly singly, and afterwards in train or dependence upon one another. <clears throat> Excuse me. Singly, they are every one a representation or appearance of some quality or other accident of a body without us, which is commonly called an object. Which object worketh on the eyes, ears, and other parts of the man's body, and by diversity of working, produceth diversity of appearances. The original of them all is that which we call sense. For there is no conception in a man's mind which hath not at first totally, or by parts, 
been begotten upon the organs of sense, the rest are derived from the original. To know the natural cause of sense is not very necessary to the business now at hand, and I have elsewhere written of the same at large. Nevertheless, to fill each part of my present method, I will briefly deliver the same in this place. The cause of sense is the external body or object which press the organ proper to each sense, either immediately, as in the task of touch, or immediately, as in seeing, hearing, and smelling, which pressure by the mediation of nerves and other strings and membranes of the body continued inwards to the brain and heart, causes there a resistance or counter-pressure or endeavor of the heart or deliver itself, which endeavor because outward seemeth to be some matter without, and this seeming or fancy is that which men call sense and consists as to the eye in the light or color figured, to the ear in a sound, to the nostril in an odor, to the tongue and palate in a savor, and to the rest of the body in heat, cold, hardness, softness, and such other qualities as we discern by feeling. All which co qualities called sensible are in the object that causes them, but so many several motions of the matter by which it press our organs diversely. Neither in us that are pressed are they anything else but diverse motions, for motion produces, produces nothing but motion. But their appearance to us is fancy, the same waking and dreaming. And as pressing, rubbing, or striking the eye makes us fancy a light, and pressing the ear produces a din, so do the bodies also we see or hear produce the same by their strong, though unobserved action. For if these colors and sounds were in the bodies or objects that caused them, they could not be severed from them as by glasses and in echoes of reflection we see they are, where we know the thing we see is in one place, the appearance in another. And though at that some certain distance the re all and every object seem invested with the fancy it begets in us, yet still the object is one thing, the image or fancy is another. So that sense in all cases is nothing else but original fancy caused, as I have said, by the pressure, that is, the motion of external things upon our eyes, ears, and other organs thereto ordained. Now, I want to stop there, and I'll stop reading from this for a moment, because I want to speak about the advertisement aspect. And, and that was the most horrifying as, as they were killing mom. And going all the way back to 2000 when they were killing Donnie and in between, you know, that in three years they were killing all of my family members. But I kept bouncing back and forth. And, and at first when, you know, of course they killed my husband, I was blaming God. I was like, what did I do? What have I done to deserve these things? And the moment I, I go into that um, state of being within psychology because of the shock implied upon me, then all of a sudden there's all these advertisements. I could go to church. I could go to this big church and this beautiful church and this pastor says this and this priest says this. And I have all of these advertisements all around me to bring me from place to place. But that is not my original being. It takes me outside of my being because I've been shocked and now I'm not able to be. When in reality, at the time that, you know, my other half and I don't just my husband he was my other half when we were not parted I didn't have to see those things I didn't have to bump into those advertisements because I was well grounded and I had my other half I, I wasn't outside of the self I wasn't seeking anything I wasn't in pain and I hadn't been shocked um, so we want to watch out for the all of these motions are Nothing but a presentation, and that's what uh, Hobbes is explaining. And I'll go back to reading. <clears throat> but the philosophy schools through all the universities of Christendom, grounded upon certain texts of Aristotle, teach another doctrine and say, for the cause of vision, that the thing seen sendeth forth on every side a visible species, in English, a visible show, apparition, or aspect, or a being seen. And of course, uh, everybody who listens to the show, you know that this uh, uh, refers to color, the color of law, the color of 
uh, medicine, the color of everything. It's an appearance or, or a guise of something that doesn't exist. It's just a concept that somebody made you believe because they repeated that concept over and over again or showed it to you in another way, whereby you're seeing these things. You can actually see these concepts. You know, that that's the shutting up the kingdom of heaven. Is being able to throw a fence in your way that's not even there. It's an imaginary thing. Uh, the receiving whereof unto the eye is seeing, and for the cause of hearing that the thing heard sendeth forth an audible species, that is an audible aspect, or audible being seen. Okay, so at this point, you're like four times outside of yourself, right? You can hear things, and, and Bo corrected me <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> I was, we um, we had gone out to eat and um, I looked over at something and I said that sounds good and he says how does that sound good? Okay, so here's all of these imaginary things and in my head I'm like oh okay and and it, it works it puts me back into the relative state of being as he's correcting me because I looked at a, a plate of something and I said that sounds good how can it sound good? You know, we're so far outside of our state of being, and, and these things slip out. And um, but it, it's it's interesting to witness these things as they occur, and, and to be corrected is what we're required to do for each other. You know, no more um, food sounding good, or or these imagination or imaginary things, or ideologies upon ideologies upon ideologies, which start out as an idea. And a thought of an idea, which is what ideology is. Ology means thought, of thought. So you've got ideologies or thoughts of, of thoughts. And that, that's the foundation of their ability to uh, maintain everything as intellectual property. It's thought of. I thought of it. I own it. That's mine. And, that, and that's why you see in, in a lot of court cases, well, that's proprietary. What's proprietary? It means it's theirs. Let's see. Um, now I'll go back. For the cause of vision that this thing seen sendeth forth on every side a visible species, in English, a visible show, apparition, or aspect, or having, being seen, the receiving whereof unto the eye is seen. And for the cause of hearing that the thing heard sendeth forth an audible species, that is an audible aspect, or audible being seen, which entering at the ear maketh hearing. Nay, for the cause of understanding also, they say the thing understood sendeth forth intelligible species, that is, an intelligible being seen, which coming unto the understanding makes us understand. I see not this as disapproving the use of universities, but because I am to speak hereafter of their office in a commonwealth. I must let you see all occasions, by the way, what things would be amended in them, amongst which the frequency of insignificant speech is one. Chapter 2 of the Imagination That when a thing lies still, unless someone else stirs it, it will lie still forever, is a truth that no man doubts of. But that when a thing is in motion, it will eternally be in motion, unless somewhat else say it, though the reason be the same, namely that nothing can change itself, is not so easily assented to. For men measure not only other men, but all other things by themselves, and because they find themselves subject after motion to pain and lassitude, think every else grows weary of motion, and seeks repose of its own accord, little considering whether it be not some other motion, wherein that desire of rest they find in themselves consisteth. From hence it is that the schools say heavy bodies fall downward out of an appetite to rest, and to conserve their nature in what place which is most proper for them ascribing appetite and knowledge of what is good for their con for conservation, which is more than man has, to things inanimate absurdly. When a body is once in motion, it moveth, unless something else hindereth eternally, and what whatsoever hindereth it cannot in an instant, but in time, and by degrees, quite extinguish it, 
and as we see in water, though the wind ceased, the waves give not over rolling for a long time after. So also it happeneth in that motion, which is made in the internal parts of man then, when he sees, dreams, etc. For after the object is removed, or the eyes shut, we still retain an image of the thing seen, though more obscure than what, when we see it. And it, this is it. Latins call imagination. From the image made in seeing and apply the same, though improperly to all other senses. But the Greeks call it fancy, which signifies appearance, and is as proper to one sense as to another. Imagination, therefore, is nothing but decaying sense, and is found in man and many other living creatures, as well as sleep is waking. The decay of sense in man waking is not the decay of motion made in sense, but an obscuring of it. In such manner is the light of the sun obscured, the light of the stars, which stars do not, no less exercise their virtue, by which they are visible in the day than in the night. But because amongst many strokes, which our eyes, ears, and other organs receive from external bodies, the predominant only is sensible. Therefore the light of the sun being predominant, we are not affected with the action of the stars. And any object being removed from our eyes, though the impression is made in us remain, yet other objects more present succeeding and working on us, the imagination of the path is a, past is obscured and made weak, as the voice of man is the noise of the day. So we're just talking about, we can describe all sorts of things, right? And we imagine everything now. I mean, the, the whole court process, law itself language all of these things we just we're imagining and we're repeating those things by description from whence it followed that the longer the time is after a sight or sense of any object the weaker is the imagination for the continual change of man's body destroyed in time the parts which in sense were in sense were moved so that distance of time and of place hath one and the same effect in us for as a great distance of place, that which we look at appears dim and without distinction of the smaller parts, and its voices grow weak and inarticulate, so after a great distance of time our imagination of the past is weak, and we lose, for example, of cities we have been, many particular streets, and of actions, many particular circumstances. The decaying sense when we would express the thing itself, I mean fancy itself, we call imagination, as I said before, but when we would express the decay and signify that the sense is fading, old, and past, it is called memory. So that imagination and memory are but one thing, which for divers, which for divers considerations have diverse names. Much memory or memory of many things is called experience. Again, imagination being only one of those things which have been formally perceived by sense, either all at once or by parts at several times. The former, which is the imagining the whole object as it was presented to the sense, is simple imagination, as one, one imagineth the man or horse which he had seen before. The other is compounded as when from the sight of a man at one time and of the horse at another, we conceive in our mind a centaur. So when a man compounded the image of his own person with the image of the actions of another man, as when a man imagines himself a Hercules or an Alexander, which happeneth often to them that are much taken with the reading of Romans, it is a compound imagination and properly but a fiction of the mind. There be also other imaginations that rise in men, though waking from the great impression made in sense. As from grazing upon the sun, the impression leaves an image of the sun before our eyes long time after, and from being long and vehemently attent upon geometrical figures, a man shall in the dark, though wake, have the images of lines and angles before his eyes, which cause, which kind of fancy hath no particular name, as being a thing that doth not commonly fall into men's discourse. And so now you, hopefully you're seeing the action of education through the Alinsky method. If you repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and describe it and show it on a piece of paper, the human subject is going to remember those things and imagine those things as we go throughout time. And through the use of language and psychology, that implicates those fences that are shutting up your kingdom. All of these imaginary things that are compounding in the mind. 
and I'll continue reading. The imaginations of them at sleep are those we call dreams, and these also, as all other imaginations, have been before either totally or by parcels in the sense. And because in sense the brain and nerves which are necessary organs of sense are so benumbed in sleep as not easily to be moved by the action of external objects, there can happen in sleep no imagination, therefore no dream, but what perceives them from the agitation of the inward parts of man's body, which inward parts for the connection they have with brain and other organs, when they be distempered, do keep the same in motion, whereby the imaginations there formerly made appear as if man were waking, saving that the organs of sense being now benumbed. So as there is no new object which can master and obscure them with a more vigorous impression, a dream must needs to be more clear in this silence of sense than are our waking thoughts. And hence it cometh to pass that it is a hard matter, and by many thought impossible to distinguish exactly between sense and dreaming. For my part, when I consider that in dreams I do not often nor constantly think of the same persons, places, objects, and actions that I do waking, nor remember so long a train of coherent thoughts, dreaming as at other times, and because waking I often observe the absurdity of dreams, but never dream of the absurdities of my waking thoughts, I am well satisfied that being awake I know I dream not, though when I dream I think myself awake. And seeing dreams are caused by the distemper of some of the inward parts of the body. Diverse distempers must needs cause different dreams. And hence it is that lying cold breedeth dreams of fear and raises the thought and image of some fearful object. The motion from the brain to the inner parts and from the inner parts to the brain being reciprocal. And that as anger causes heat in some parts of the body when we are awake, so when we in sleep the overheating of some parts causes anger and raises up the brain the imagination of an enemy in some manner as natural kindness when we are awake causes desire and desire makes heat in certain other parts of the body so also too much heat in those parts while we sleep raises in the brain an imagination of some kindness shown in some our dreams are the reverse of our waking imaginations the motions when we are awake beginning at one end and when we dream at another the most difficult discerning of a man's dream from his waking thoughts is then when by some accident we observe not that we have slept, which is easy to happen to a man full of fearful thoughts and those conscious is much troubled, and that sleepeth without the circumstances of going to bed or putting off his clothes as one that noddeth in the chair. For he that taketh pains and industriously lays himself to sleep, in case any uncouth or exorbitant fancy come unto him, cannot easily think it other than a dream. We read of Marcus Brutus, one that had his life given him by Julius Caesar, and was also his favorite, notwithstanding murdereth him. How at Philippi, the night before he gave battle to Augustus Caesar, he saw a fearful apparition, which is commonly related by historians, as a vision, but considering the circumstances, one may easily judge to have been but a short dream. For sitting in his tent, pensive and troubled with the horror of his rash act, it was not hard for him, slumbering in the cold, to dream of what, of that which most affrighted him, which fear, as by degrees it made him wake, so also it must needs make the apparition by degrees to vanish. And having no assurance that he slept, he could have no cause to think it a dream or anything but a vision. And this is no very rare accident, for even they that be perfectly awake, if they be tumorous and superstitious, possessed with fearful tales, and alone in the dark, are subject to the like fancies. And I believe these they see spirits of, and dead men's ghosts walking in churchyards, whereas it is either their fancy only, or else the knavery of such persons, as make use of such superstitious fare to pass disguise in the night to places they would be not be known to haunt. Now, this brings us to talking about the fear porn that you're exposed to every day, 9-11 and, and the terrorist attacks and all of these things that they maintain through. And this brings me to the fear porn that has been maintained through the media 
sorry, I think I cut out on the station, um, uh, for such as 9-11 and the terrorist attacks and all of these things that you've been exposed to, they're creating weights and measures so that you walk around always in fear. Well, if you're always in fear, you always need a daddy. You always need a parent. You always need something or savior to come in and save you by which you're living in this fiction. Now continue reading. From this ignorance of how to distinguish dreams and other strong fancies from vision and sense did arise the greatest part of the religion of the Gentiles in some past that worships satires, fawns, nymphs, and the like, and now a days the opinion that rude people have of fairies, ghosts, and goblins, and of the powers of witches. For as for witches, I think not that their witchcraft is any real power, but yet they are still justly punished for the false belief they have, and that they can do such mischief joined in their purpose to do it if they can, their trade being nearer to a new religion than to a craft or science. And for fairies and walking ghosts, the opinion of them has, I think, been on purpose, either taught or not confuted, to keep in credit the use of exorcism, of crosses, of holy water, and other such inventions of ghostly men. Nevertheless, there is no doubt but God can make unnatural apparitions, but that he does it so often as men need to fear such things more than they fear the stay or change of the course of nature, which he can also stay and change is no point of Christian faith. But evil men, under pretext that God can do anything, are so bold as to say anything that serves their turn. Though they think it untrue, it is a part of a wise man to believe them no further than right reason makes that which they say appear credible. If this superstitious fear of spirits were taken away with that prognotiques and dreams, false prophecies, and many other things depending thereon by which crafty, ambitious persons abuse the simple people, men would be much more fitted than they are for civil obedience. And this ought to be the work of schools, but they rather nourish such doctrine, for not knowing what imagination or the senses are, what they receive they teach. Some saying that imaginations rise of themselves and have no cause, others that they rise most commonly from the will, and that good thoughts are blown, inspired into a man by God, and evil thoughts by the devil, or that good thoughts are powered or infused into a man by God, and evil ones by the devil. Some say the sense receive the species of things, and deliver them to the common sense, and the common sense delivers them over to the fancy, and the fancy to the memory, and the memory to the judgment like handfuls of things one from one to another, with many words making nothing understood. The imagination that is raised in a man or any other creature induce, endued with the facility of imagining by words or other voluntary signs is what we generally call understanding, and is common to man and beast. For a doggy by custom will understand the call or the rating of his master, and so will many other beasts. That understanding, which is peculiar, pe peculiar to a man, is the understanding not only his will, but his conceptions and thoughts by the sequel and contexture of the names and things into affirmations, negations, and other forms of speech. And one of this kind of understanding I shall speak hereafter. Chapter 3. Of the Consequence of Train of Imaginations, or Train of Thought. By consequence or train of thoughts, I understand that succession of one thought to another, which is called to distinguish it from the discourse in words, mental discourse. When a man thinketh or anything whatsoever, his next thought after is not altogether so casual as it seems to be. Not every thought to every thought succeeds indifferently, but as we have no imagination whereof we have not formerly had sense in whole or in parts, so we have no transmission from one imagination to another, whereof we never had the like before in our senses. The reason wherefore is this. All fancies are motions within us, relics of those made in the sense, and those motions that immediately succeeded one another in the sense continue also after sense, in so much as the former coming again to take place in the predominant, the later followeth by coherence of the ma matter involved, matter moved in such manner as water upon a plane, table is drawn which way any one part of it is guided by the finger but because in sense to one and the same thing perceives sometimes one thing 
sometimes another succeeded. It comes to pass in time that in the imagining of anything, there is no certainty what we wish shall imagine next. Only this is certain. It shall be something that succeeded the same before at one time or another. This train of thoughts are mental discourses of two sorts. The first is unguided, without design, and incons inconstant, wherein there is no passionate thought to govern and direct those that follow to itself as the end of sc and scope of some desire or other passion, in which case the thoughts are said to wander and seem impertinent one to another as in a dream. Such commonly the thoughts of men that are not only without company, but also without care of anything, though even then their thoughts are as busy as at other times, with, but without harmony, as a sound with a lute out of tune would yield to any man or in tune to one that could not play. And yet in this wide way, wild ranging of the mind, a man may oft times perceive the way of it, and the dependence of one thought upon another. For in the discourse of our present civil war, that could seem more important than to ask, as one did, what was the value of a Roman penny? Yet the coherence to me was manifest enough, for the thought of the war introduced the thought of the delivering up the king to his enemies. The thought of that brought in the thought of the delivering up of Christ, and that, again, the thought of the thirty pence, which was the price of that treason. And, that, and thence easily followed that malicious question, and all this in a moment of time, for a thought is quick. The second is more constant, as being regulated by some desire and design, for the impression made by such things as we desire or fear is strong and permanent, or, if it cease for a time, a quick return, so strong it is sometimes, as to hinder and break our sleep. From desire arises the thought of some means we have seen produce, produce the like of that which we aim at, and from the thought of that, the thoughts of means to that end, to that mean, and so continually till we come to some beginning within our own power. And because the end by the greatness of the impression comes up into mind, in case our thoughts begin to wander, they are quickly again reduced into the way which, observed by one of the seven wise men, made him give men this precept, which is now worn out, Respis finum, that is to say, in all of your actions, look often upon what you would have as the thing that directs all your thoughts in a way to attain it. The train of regulated thoughts is of two kinds. One, when of an effect imagined, we seek the causes or means that produce it, and this is common to man and beast. The other is when imagining anything whatsoever we seek, all the possible effects that can be by it be produced, that is to say, we imagine what we can do with it when we have it, of which I have not seen at any time seen any sign, but in men only, for this is a curiosity hardly incident to the nature of any living creature that has no other passion but sensual such as hunger, thirst, lust, and anger. In some, the discourse of the mind, when it is governed by design, is nothing but seeking or the faculty of invention, which the Latins call sagacitis and solaria, a hunting out of the causes of some effect present or past, or of the effects of some present or past cause. Sometimes a man seeks what he hath lost, and from pl that place and time wherein he misses it, his mind runs back from place to place, from time to time, to find where and when he had it. That is to say, to find some certain and limited time and place in which to begin a method of seeking. Again, from thence his thoughts run over the same places and times, to find what action or other occasions might make him lose it. This we call remembrance, or calling to mind. The Latins call it reminiscia, as it were reconning of our former actions. Sometimes a man knows a place determined, determinate within the compass whereof he is to seek, and then his thoughts run over all the parts thereof in the same manner as one would sweep a room to find a jewel, or as a spaniel 
ranges the field till he finds a tent or as a man should run over the alphabet to start a rhyme. Sometimes a man desires to know the event of an action, and then he thinketh of some like action past, and the events thereof one after another, supposing like events will follow like actions. And he for that foresees what will become of criminal recons what he has seen follow on the like crime before, having this order of thoughts. The crime, the officer, the prison, the judge, and the gallows. Which kind of thoughts is called foresight, and prudence, or providence, and sometimes wisdom, though such conjecture through the difficulty of, the, of observing all circumstances be very fallacious, but this is certain by how much one man has more experience of things past than another. By so much also he is more prudent, and his expectations the seldomer fail him. The present only has a being in nature, things past have a being in memory only, but things to come have no being at all, the future being but a fiction of the mind, applying the sequels of actions of the past to the actions that are present, which with most certainly is done by him that has most experience, but not with certainty enough. And though it could be called prudence, even the event answereth our expectations, yet in its own nature it is but a presumption. For the foresight of things to come, which is providence, belongs only to him by those who will they are to come. From him only and supernaturally proceeds prophecy. The best prophet naturally is the best guesser, and the best guesser he that is most versed in studying in the matters he guesses at, for he hath most signs to guess by. A sign is the event antecedent at the consequent and contrarily the consequent of the antecedent when the like consequences have been observed before and the oftener they have been observed the less uncertain is the sign and therefore he that has most experience in any kind of business has most signs whereby to guess at the future time and consequently is most prudent and so much more prudent that he is new in that kind of business as not to be equaled by any advantage of natural and exemptor, exemplary wit, though her, perhaps many young men think the contrary. Now what he's delving into is such as futures. I mean, future trading, you can, um, you've got the corporate council that games all of these cases. That is actually what uh, prophecies are. The false prophet is a game theorist that games your demise from beginning to end or how to use your body throughout your lifespan to be of most efficient profit for the directors of that policy. So all of these things away, you are predetermined. Well, how are you predetermined? If you go all the way back to Plato, he says in, um, uh, I think it's Critalis, if you tell me your name, I can tell you where you come from. That's It's a precise science. It's a very precise science on how you are predetermined based on the concepts that you are holding. And that's why Jesus said, divest yourself of all that possesses you. Drop all of those concepts. You have to, otherwise you're predictable in everything that you do, whereby you can be that mechanism. You can be a machine. You can be a, a piece on a chessboard. And I'll continue reading. Nevertheless, it is not prudent that distinguisheth man from beast, that there be beasts that at a year old observe more and pursue that which is for their good more prudently than a child can do at ten. As prudence is presumption of the future, contracted from the experience of time past, so there is a presumption of things past taken from other things, not future, but past also. For he that hath seen by what courses and degrees a flourishing state hath first come into civil war, and then to ruin upon the side of ruins of any other state, will guess like the like war and the like courses have been there also. But this conjecture, conjecture has the same uncertainty almost with the conjecture of the future, both being grounded only upon experience. There is no other act of man's mind that I can remember naturally planted in him, so as to need no other thing to the exercise of it, but to be born a man and live with the use of his five senses. Those other faculties of which I shall speak by and by, and which seem proper to man only, are acquired and increased by study and industry, and of most men learned by instruction and discipline, and proceed all from the inventions of words 
and speech. For besides sense and thoughts, and the train of thoughts, the mind of a man has no other motion, though by the help of speech and method the same faculties may be improved by such a height as to distinguish men from all other living creatures. Whatsoever we imagine is finite, therefore there is no idea or conception of anything we call infinite. No man can have his, in his mind an image of infinite magnitude, nor conceive infinite swiftness, infinite time, or infinite force, or infinite power. When we say anything is infinite, we signify only that we are not able to conceive the ends and bounds of the thing named, having no conception of the thing, but of our own inability. And therefore the name of God is used not to make us conceive him, for he is incomprehensible, and its greatness and power are unconceivable, but that way me, that we may honor him. Also because whatsoever, as I said before, we conceive has been perceived first by sense, either all at once or by parts, a man can have no thought representing anything not subject to sense. No man therefore can conceive anything, but he must conceive it in some place and induced with some determinate magnitude, and which may be divided into parts. Nor that anything is, in, is all in this place and all in another place at the same time, nor that two or more things can be in one and the same place at another, for none of these things ever have or can be incident to sense, but are absurd speeches taken upon credit without any significance at all from deceived philosophers and deceived or deceiving schoolmen. Chapter 4 of Speech The Great Rhetoric The invention of printing, though ingenious, compared with the invention of letters, is no great matter, but who was the first that found the use of letters is not known. He that first brought them into Greece, men say, was Cadmus, the son of Agenor, king of Phoenicia, a profitable invention for continuing the memory of time past and the conjunction of mankind dispersed into so many and distant re regions of the earth, and with all difficulties proceeding from watchful observation of the diverse motions of the tongue, palate, lips, and other organs of speech, whereby to make many differences of characters to remember them. But the most noble and profitable invention of all other was that of speech, consisting of names or appellations, and their connection, whereby men register their thoughts, recall them when they are past, and also declare them from one to another for mutual utility and conversation, without which there had been amongst men neither commonwealth, nor society, nor contract, nor peace, no more than amongst lions, bears, and wolves. The first author of speech was God himself that instructed Adam how to name such creatures as he presented to his sight, for the scripture goeth no further in this matter. But this was sufficient to direct him to add more names, as the experience and use of creatures should give him occasion, and to join them in such manner by degrees, as to make himself understood, and so by succession of time so much language might be forgotten, as he had found used for, though not so copious as an orator or a philosopher has a need of. For I do not find anything in the scripture out of which directly or by consequence can be gathered that Adam was taught the names of all figures, numbers, measures, colors, sounds, fancies, relations, much less the names of words and speech, as general, special, affirmative, negative, interrogative, optative, infinitive, all which are useful and least of all an entity intentionally, quiddity, and other significant words, insignificant words of the school. But all this language gotten and augmented by Adam and his posterity was again lost at the Tower of Babel, when by the hand of the Lord God every man was stricken for his rebellion with an oblivion of his former language, and being hereby forced to disperse themselves into several all parts of the world, it must needs be that the diversity of tongues that now is preceded by degrees from them, in such manner as need. The mother of all inventions taught them, and in the tact of time grew everywhere more copious. The general use of speech is to transfer our mental discourse into verbal, or the train of our thoughts into a train of words, and that for two commodities, 
whereof one is the registering of the consequences of our thoughts, which being apt to slip out of our memory and put us to new labor, may again be recalled by such words as they were marked by. So that the first uses of names is to serve for marks or notes of remembrance. Another is when many use the same words to signify by their connection and order one to another what they conceive or think of each matter, and also what they desire, fear, or have any other passion for. And for this use they are called signs. Special use of speech are these. First, to register what by cogitation we find to be the cause of any thing present or past, and what we find things present or past may produce or affect which in some is acquiring of the art. Secondly, to show to others that knowledge which we have attained, which is to counsel and teach one another. Thirdly, to make known to others our wills and purposes, that we may have the mutual help of one another. Fourthly, to please and delight ourselves and others by playing with our words for pleasure or ornament innocently. To these uses, there are also four correspondent abuses. First, when men register their thoughts wrong by the inconstancy of the signification of their words by which they register for their conceptions, that which they were never conceived, and so deceive themselves. Secondly, when the use of words metaphorically, that is in another sense other than that they are ordained for, and thereby deceive others. Thirdly, when by words they declare that to be their will which is not. Fourthly, when they use them to grieve one another, for seeing nature harm, hath armed living creatures, some with teeth, some with horns, and some with hands, to grieve an enemy, it is but an abuse of speech to grieve him with the tongue, unless it be one whom we are obliged to govern. We'll be back next uh, Thursday, folks, uh, Thursday night, 8 to 10, right here on Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, also simulcast on these changing times, and No Borders Radio, be well.